how they really are not. You know, they don't map on at all um, in 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 any with any kind of precision. Um, uh, yeah, beyond like in a place like the Philippines using the English term indigenous peoples. That's it, you know, as far as I'm concerned, but everything else doesn't really, it, it really doesn't match. Um, yeah, it's like square pegs into round holes. Um, anyway, but yeah, so that's that's my, my answer to that. Um, uh, oh, okay, so history, theory of history. Hmm. <laughs> Yes, that's 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 uh, I can't answer that question. Um, I would pay attention though to periodization, because I think that that's that's something that really structures how we think about the past and how we might potentially think about the future. And so, if we're going to rethink anything, we need to rethink periodization in Southeast Asia. So, like I said um, earlier, we think about pre-colonial. Southeast Asia or pre-colonial whatever country you're working on, and then colonial period, and then the post-colonial period. That's the general sort of you know thing. But but that's like saying that, um, and I got this from from Kathy. You know, it's like it's like it's like talking about the Anthropocene, but using uh, Europe as the the sort of um, the European experience uh, um, uh, as as a sort of um, uh, vantage point for uh, for um, determining like when the uh, Anthropocene started and and what it what particular stages um, uh, we're um, in right now. Um, uh, whereas if you look at other parts of the world, uh, you know we might have a, a completely different periodization as far as that's concerned. Although I don't know if you'd really call it periodization. But you know, um, uh, uh, something that 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 should be universal or and is discussed as if it were universal um, is still very, very Eurocentric um, uh, right now. Um, uh, but if you work in other parts of the world, you usually know better, right? Um, and so it's the same thing with periodization of of history, um, um, even of colonial history, um, uh, you know, in, in Southeast Asia, uh, th these things um, can look very different depending on your your vantage point. Um, and uh, now we we talk just just as a sort of a rough example. Um, uh, when we talk about Southeast Asian uh, uh, colonization of Southeast Asia, we usually begin with what's the what's the what's the definitive event? What's like the beginning? The sacking of Malacca, right? Uh, in uh, what 1511, right? That's usually oh yeah, it starts with the sacking of Malacca. Like with the Philippines, the beginning of the colonial period is the arrival of Magellan uh, uh, in 1521. But uh, what if we kind of um, uh, took that thing out and and started thinking about uh, colonization in a different way. Um, when when does it become uh, colonial? When does it actually become a colony? When the purported colonizer declares it so, or when things have been uh, finally restructured. Um, in in terms of that particular locality, uh, you know, up to a, a uh, past a certain point, you know, what's what's the point at which you can say that uh, this place was colonized versus it wasn't? So, for, in the Philippines, when you talk about the colonial history of the Philippines, say 1521, boom, that's the beginning, beginning of the end, right? But when you're in a place like Mindanao in the southern Philippines, where I I, I do my studies and where my um, my book, A Mountain of Difference, um, you know, uh, is 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 about about the colonial period um, in 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 um, in in Mindanao. Um, you know, looking through the Spanish archives themselves, I found that the Spaniards never really actually managed to colonize Mindanao in in a in a in a meaningful way until very very late into the um, 1800s. Uh, and they acknowledge it themselves in their own um, reports. You know, it's like, look, we only control a sliver of the coast, and you know, the natives basically can do anything they want. And and the natives were definitely 
playing the Spaniards um, in a lot of ways, saying, okay, sure, we'll pledge fealty to the king, but you're going to give us this, and you're going to give us this, and we're gonna, not going to pay any taxes, and we're going to, and Spain said yes, you know, um, and so does that count as colonized or not, you know? Uh, that's 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 uh, that to me is 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 I think a very very important question to ask when we think about the colonial period, you know, um, and it's not just a matter of different parts of the region were colonized differently or incorporated in a different you know to different uh, intensities um, during this particular period. To me, it's like it blows up the whole idea of colonial period in the first place and, and the, the whole idea of um, colonized and the colony. So yeah, yeah. so uh, there's a comment here about Thailand has never been colonized. Yes, and I know that that's a really popular refrain, but, uh, but Thailand has been profoundly um, uh, um, influenced, uh, profoundly changed by uh, um, the colonial experience of its neighbors. And so it's still impacted significantly by coloniality, okay? But of course, yeah, not colonized, but then we can't say that col the colonial period or that, 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 that colo col colonialism had no impact on Thailand. So, I mean, so what, what conversation do you wanna have, right? Do you wanna just be able to classify colonized versus non-colonized? Uh, there's just a lot more going on there. And, and if we stop thinking about colonization or the colonial period in, in the way that we're talking about right now, I mean, basically we think of the colonial period based on when colonizers claimed to have colonized, you know, these places. Um, you know, if we, re, we, we kind of try to approach periodization from a completely different perspective, we're gonna come up with a different periodization. Yeah. So we might not even say that, oh, colonial period. I mean, I, I'm not saying that that's gonna be the case, but, but it might end up being irrelevant. We might have a completely different way of thinking about how it's impacted um, uh, or about the history of Southeast Asia and not think of it as colonial period, pre-colonial, post-colonial. Yeah, so anyway, but um, yeah, so. Thank you. Um, thank you, Al, for the question and Una for the exchange. The order I have is um, is Rebecca, Wani, and Vernon. So, Rebecca. Thank you. And thank you so much for these comments. Um, that exchange in particular was really helpful for me as someone who is working on current issues in Thailand and along the border region. This is certainly something I'm thinking about a whole lot. Oh, um, I was wondering um, in relation to like what you were talking about, um, about like the long-term decolonizing and needing to get away from uh, reacting to um, like Western institutional standards for how how scholarship is supposed to look and react, like getting out of reacting to um, colonized methods. Where do you draw inspiration from currently? Or like, do you see any sort of, what do you see as inspiration for these sorts of projects um, within and outside of academia, maybe in like art and activist spaces? Um, is there anything that like comes to mind when you think of that yet? Mm. <laughs> uh, that's hard to answer because it's it's been a lifetime of 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 um, I guess trying to read new things and rethink things. So, um, but more recently, um, I think just just getting more so diving more into the whole. Uh, indigenous studies thing has been really illuminating for me um, because um, I think compared to um, what we've been doing on it in Southeast Asian studies, there's been so much um, um, going on um, in the Americas um, by a wide variety of scholars. Um, and so there's been a lot of sort of 
uh, really interesting um, intellectual development on on these questions. Um, and the most um, uh, exciting thing for me, at least, that really kind of you know sometimes you read something and your your mind is just like right. Um, was that I read this. Uh, uh, it was a special issue in a journal that I can't even remember the name right now. It's it's in a stack on my desk somewhere, in a in a pile like this this deep. But it it was basically um, Scandinavian uh, um, publication about um, rethinking colonization and coloniality in um, Central and South America, and. It was just really, I mean, half the scholars were Scandinavian and, you know, the other half were, um, uh, you know, from the from the Americas, um, uh, from, uh, yeah, Central and South America. Uh, and, and so that kind of really opened my mind, um, uh, you know, in, in terms of like how I think about coloniality um, and, uh, and, and colonization and decolonization and decoloniality and then um uh, and then also around the same time um just getting sort of more uh immersed in indigenous twitter has been really kind of a wild ride um and it's been great because uh it involves a lot of listening to um indigenous peoples who are scholars um including some who are not but you know in more in an activist space and where they're talking about uh, you know, it's for them. It's both a scholarship, and uh, n about not their biographies, but about their. Um, uh, they have a, there's a lot of conversations and sometimes monologues going on about how they're kind of positioning and repositioning themselves um, as indigenous peoples, as scholars, and then at the same time as. Americans and Canadians, um, uh, you know, in the world today, and and so that's kind of really, uh, you know, I, I think it kind of um, it it's 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 something exciting to really learn about, um, uh, you know, um, uh, to be basically trying to hear a perspective that's uh, very different from my own, um, but that's also expressed in a way that um, I can. Uh, relate to um, because I mean there's some of these kinds of conversations happening in um, the community that I um, um, work with the Higaonons um, in in North Mindanao and and as well as other people like them um, in the Philippines and and other people in Southeast Asia but they they're they're talking about these things in in their own sort of way with their local concerns. But indigenous Twitter and and these these this, these kinds of scholars that I've been um, exposing myself to um, more uh, more recently since the pandemic really um, are kind of speaking more my language and um, dealing with you know uh, the the same kinds of concerns because they are also like me very much um, you know have have been. Um, brought up in sort of the Western tradition, intellectual tradition. And so they're in conversation with the same stuff that I am. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, uh, yeah. So in, in a sense, they're kind of speaking more my language and, and, and kind of I'm getting an education in that. So I would maybe point to that first, but of course there's been tons and tons of different influences over, over, over the years, um, uh, including um, archeologists uh, that I learned from when I was an undergrad. Um, like like Kathy, so yeah. For those of you who don't know, Kathy Morrison was was my undergrad professor, um, but uh, we're actually not that far apart in age. But but I started late um, in 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 college, and then she, you know, uh, became a professor at a very very young age.